Hi, I'm John Forty. Coming up on the St. Paul Forum, I'll be speaking with Matt Antenza, founder of the Minnesota 2020 Think Tank, based in St. Paul. That's next on the St. Paul Forum. Welcome to the St. Paul Forum. I'm John Forty. With me today is Matt Antenza, founder and senior fellow at Minnesota 2020, a St. Paul-based think tank. Welcome, Matt. It's good to be here today, John. Um, tell us your history. You did, were not born in this state, but since you got here, you've kind of taken it over. Well, I don't know about that, but my family was from uh, Minnesota originally, like a lot of Minnesota families. Uh, wound up in uh, California for a period of time. A, misbegotten view of the world that uh, somehow better weather meant a better economy. And, uh, but I spent all my summers in Minnesota when I was young and then moved back here to finish high school in Worthington, Minnesota. And my mom had gone to McAllister and uh, so I was lucky enough to be able to move to St. Paul and other than a, a short time in uh, graduate school have lived in St. Paul here my entire adult life. That's very modest of you because I believe graduate school was Oxford. Well, that was, yeah, you know, <laughs> the reality is, is I got an opportunity to go study in Oxford. So when you're a, a kid who's gone to a college here in St. Paul and you're from a rural Minnesota town, you can hardly say no to Oxford. And it was a tremendous opportunity. Uh, but you know, one of the things I learned, mm -hmm. people here complain about the weather. Mm -hmm. No one should complain about the weather here <laughs> yes. because, yes, it's cold, but you can dress up for that kind of cold. And we have great sun. Uh, Oxford is mired in rain and fog all the time. It's beautiful there in its own way. But I tell you, I couldn't come back to Minnesota fast enough. Uh, I was able to learn there and then come back here and go to the U and go to law school and ultimately serve uh, in our state legislature. But uh, I, I knew St. Paul was the place I wanted to be. Now, in full disclosure, you and I have been friends for about 30 years. And, uh, and, and doing, you're 29, which and, is even and, more remarkable. And, and doing <laughs> what passes for prep for this show, I actually read some about your past. And you actually taught some. Maybe it's not accurate. Did you teach some in England? Yeah. Uh, so after I graduated from McAllister College with a degree in environmental studies and then uh, went over to uh, England after first working for Paul Wellstone. It was before Paul was in the U.S. Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul was uh, involved in tremendous amounts of community organizing. He was really uh, my first great sort of political uh, mentor. And I, you know, for those uh, who don't know Paul, of course, he was a U.S. Senator who tragically died uh, you know, uh, about 10 years ago in a plane crash, which was just, just awful for all of us. But he sort of taught me, and then I was able to uh, go to England, uh, went to, uh, got a law degree over there, and then uh, taught there and uh, really enjoyed it, had a great opportunity. And those people are educable. Well, they have a funny accent, but okay. yes, yes, they are. <laughs> right. Now, the funny yeah. thing is you, when you live in a place like England mm -hmm. um, and you go to the store and say, where's the aluminum? They don't know what you're talking about because they're looking for you know, something completely different. It's aluminum? Aluminum, okay. yeah. They my Which is probably technically more accurate given the spelling. I guess. Well, my favorite one was when I wanted oregano for the pizza. They said, no, it's oregano. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, good. So the state of Oregon. <laughs> um, now, you've had politics in your blood since, well, probably since the womb, as far as I can tell. But, but you went to law school upon getting back here. You went to the U of M mm -hmm. and made good friends with somebody else there. Well, uh, law school's a funny place. You sit alphabetically. So my last name is Antenza, mm -hmm. which uh, it's... My father was adopted, so I have a Spanish last name, even though I'm mostly Norwegian, as folks can tell by looking at the blue eyes and mm -hmm. what have you. But uh, next to me was an E-L, and it was Ellison, as in Keith Ellison, who, of course, is the member of Congress from Minneapolis and uh, one of my dearest friends in the world. Uh, it reminds me, because uh, uh, yesterday I was at McAllister College where they inaugurated the Joan Adams Mondale Art Center at McAllister, and Vice President Mondale was there, and I got to talk to him. And Vice President Mondale went to law school uh, with Ron Meshbesher, who people might remember, a famous criminal defense attorney. Mm -hmm. Mondell, Meshbesher, they were M's. And then I worked for a federal judge after I left uh, uh, the University of Minnesota. Harry McLaughlin. Harry McLaughlin, who was Walter Mondale's law partner, another M. So you go to law school and you get... <laughs> it matters you, how it's spelled. You gotta, ho you gotta <laughs> hope. I don't know if you were there being in the F's, who you would have met, <laughs> yeah. but probably someone very interesting. Okay. Um, and so you taught law then at St. Mary's, but. I don't know, was it, was it fun to teach? 
Yeah, so after I got out of law school and uh, worked for a judge for a while, then I went to work for Skip Humphrey in our attorney general's office, and I did charities uh, fraud cases. So I sued telemarketers, which is fun. Mm -hmm. it, because you know, they're the people who think they get to call you up and take money away from you. Mm -hmm. So when you bust down the doors and <laughs> grab all of their stuff and then uh, get all the money back and then uh, work with the feds to put them in jail, it's, a, it's enormously, enormously fun. And while I was doing that, I taught at the graduate program at St. Mary's University, which I know uh, you mm -hmm. were a part of uh, as well. Mm -hmm. And I uh, had great fun teaching uh, law to people who were going to become healthcare administrators and others. So that opportunity to teach is something that I really enjoyed, but the opportunity to be a prosecutor and go after people who are ripping off people, particularly seniors, was something I really enjoyed. Man, you, you have a great story. And even before we get to where it really begins, which is your entry into politics, um, you had one more job, and that was as a white-collar prosecutor yeah. in Hennepin County. Yeah, so uh, it sort of was uh, happened at the same time. Uh, I love the Attorney General's office. I love prosecuting uh, fraud cases. Uh, I, just to give you a sort of a flavor, the sorts of things that I was able to work on, and the kind of state that we are, uh, we had a young woman up in Moorhead named Megan Griggs. She was a little girl. Uh, she had developed a disease where her liver wasn't working properly. It was releasing an enzyme, and it was slowly, literally destroying her brain. And so people up in the Fargo-Moorhead area had raised money, literally kids raising quarters and pennies and things mm -hmm. like that. They raised a couple hundred thousand dollars. They entrusted it uh, to a family who described themselves as uh, ministers uh, down in Texas. And... Uh, she was able to get an operation, get a liver transplant, so she could live and become, uh, become better, and it did, it did make a positive difference. The problem is these two so-called ministers in Texas stole the money, and so the hospital where she'd gotten the transplant said, you owe us this money, and I was able to uh, sue these so-called ministers, and then we discovered there were other uh, Minnesota children who were waiting for transplants, and their money had been stolen, and we got all that back, and those were the sorts of things I was able to work on. It was an, fun and personally satisfying, but uh, I got the opportunity in 1993 to run for the state legislature. A great woman named Kathy Valenga, who many people will recall, another McAllister graduate, mm -hmm. had been a great state representative for many years for the Mac Groveland and Marion Park and Summit Hill area. And she decided to step down, and when I decided to run for that seat, I also had to leave the Attorney General's office, because you, uh, sure. you can't be part of the executive branch and be part of the legislative yeah. branch. Uh, and that's when uh, Mike Freeman, who was, uh, was then and is still now the county attorney in Hennepin County, uh, knew I wanted to keep practicing law even when I was in the legislature. And so I became a white-collar crime prosecutor and there uh, went after a whole series of people who were engaged in financial fraud, the kind of stuff that we saw come home to roast even more so in the recession. And then I had a little uh, side specialty in environmental polluters. And I tell you, when you get the kind of people who are going to pollute the environment and do bad things, they never think they'll go to jail. They think the worst they're going to have to do is write a check. That's all they think they're ever <laughs> yeah. going to have to do. And it was an enormously gratifying job because Mike is a great uh, county attorney in Hennepin County and who would back me up, and we put a bunch of polluters in jail. And it was, it was a great, uh, great experience. It really helped me then when I went into the legislature. And uh, Mike left that job for a while. Amy Klobuchar had that job, and then Mike got it again. Yeah, uh, Mike was Hennepin County Attorney for eight years. He ran uh, for governor mm -hmm. and uh, was uh, defeated in a DFL primary, an experience I, I'm also familiar with. Okay. And he, uh, uh, after eight years then in private practice, when Amy became our U.S. Senator, uh, where she's also done a really nice job, uh, then, I, then he returned as Hennepin County Attorney. So he's, he's still back there. So you spent six terms in the Minnesota House mm -hmm. and became leader of the Democrats in the House. Representing St. Paul. Yeah. And... Uh, let me tell you, one, just sort of a St. Paul story, because I think St. Paulites always realize how great our city is. Representatives from other parts of the state would complain, and they would say, you know, they, and they loved their area. It wasn't they didn't like their area, but they'd complain and say, you know, people in my area, they only want me to work on one thing. They only want me to work on a social issue or getting a big bonding project, you know, getting a new building. Um, I remember one guy who was dogged for years because... Uh, the mayor and the other folks in the city said, you've got to get the money for a wastewater treatment program. So literally, sewage was his main issue for four <laughs> years. That's what he had to work yeah. on. But uh, representing uh, 64A, which was Grand Avenue, and I represented St. Thomas and McAllister and William Mitchell and Concordia University and all those areas, uh, was so great because uh, I had the best educated constituency in the state. I mean, it, it, that's mm -hmm. a factual matter. It's not that I just felt that way. It's a factual matter. 
And on top of that, people had such diverse interests and I was able to work on different things and I wasn't punished uh, when I wanted to work on child protection or when I wanted to work for better schools or when I wanted to, to work to try and uh, get some new economic development for St. Paul. People were really supportive of it and they mostly appreciated I was willing to work on different issues as opposed to one thing. Now, I mean, the art of politics, I mean, poly means many, and there, <laughs> there, you have so many peers in the House, mm. and you get 134, to be, yeah, 134 and, people. And you get to be leader of, of the Democrats, which it was a majority, then a minority, then a majority again. Well, when I took over, we were deep, deep in the minority. Okay. That was after the 2002 election, which was, uh, for those of you who are mm -hmm. into history, not a particularly uh, good year for Democrats. Right after 9-11, mm -hmm. uh, the country and the, this is a state were pretty fearful. And Paul Wellstone had just died in the plane crash. And so Democrats did badly, and I was deputy leader of the House Democrats. Uh, my friend Tom Pugh from West St. Paul decided to step down. So we took over, and we literally called ourselves the Merry Band because we, more than could fit in a phone booth, but there weren't a lot of Democrats <laughs> at that stage in the yeah. legislature. And uh, with help from people like uh, Tim Mahoney from East St. Paul and Sheldon Johnson from East St. Paul, uh, Alice Johnson, Carlos Marie Arney, and others who supported me, uh, we worked our way back, so by the time I left, we went into the majority, and the Democrats, for most of uh, the time since then, have been in the majority. So I'm, I'm really proud of what we did. And we did it because we really focused on saying, how do we make a better state? And we said, we're going to focus on education, we're going to focus on transportation and health care, and really build things up and get out of the divisive politics uh, that uh, we saw a lot of people like Tim Pawlenty getting into, of constantly trying to divide people, uh, which just, you know, you don't make a great state that way. Um, I understand the, the, the group congealing, but why you? I mean, you, you've got <laughs> charisma and you've got dynamism, but there's a secret sauce there of the way you listen and massage all those competing constituencies, because the range people are very different from the, the farm people. Well, uh, some people said it was because I was the tallest uh, guy there, <laughs> okay. so I, okay. I could just sort of be able to serve everyone. <laughs> yeah. But the reality, anyone, uh, you know, Will Rogers always had the best quote. He said, I'm not a member of an organized party. I'm a Democrat. Yeah. And the reality is, you know, the Iron Range Democrats are feisty and uh, they're fighters and they want to fight for their areas. The uh, folks from the uh, rural uh, farm areas tend to be a little more laid back, but they care about their areas. And... Uh, but most of all, what I appreciate about my colleagues is they were looking for uh, to get away from the factionalism and the fighting and looking for someone who was going to help pull us together mm -hmm. and get some unifying themes. And sometimes when you're way down, which is what we were, they're willing to do that. And uh, if I have a, a gift, I'd like to believe it's that I listen well and I'm able to pull people together. And that's why we had success. Election after election, we had some really good success and we were able to, to bring things together. Great. Okay. In case you're just joining us, this is the St. Paul Forum. I'm John Forty. Today I'm interviewing Matt Entenza, founder and senior fellow of Minnesota 2020, a St. Paul-based think tank. So we've just finished that part of the career. Anything else you want to add to that? There, there must be, you know where bodies are buried, right? Well, uh, the reality in politics, there's, there's a lot of good stories. So I'll, I'll tell you one of my uh, favorite ones. Most folks, as you know, my job at the Attorney General's office was to sue telemarketers. And so when I went into the legislature, I wanted to keep working on those issues because I am not fond of telemarketers calling people up late at night and ripping them off. So uh, I had a bill with support from AARP, which is a, a great group, um, and the bill was to say that people couldn't get called if they were on a list blocking their number. And we had a lot of groups who fought us, uh, sadly including the Chamber of Commerce and others. Um, and the bill was moving forward, but we had an obstacle. And the obstacle was the majority leader of the House, Tim Pawlenty, who, of course, later became governor of the state of Minnesota. And uh, he was saying that he wasn't going to allow our bill to go up. We knew that we had the votes to pass it, but as majority leader, he had the power to stop the bill from even being considered on the floor of the House, which is a tremendous amount of power. So we had AARP go out and talk to seniors around the state, but particularly in St. Paul and in Egan, where he was from, and they bombarded his office with calls, and they literally shut the phone system down. So many <laughs> seniors called. Yeah. And so he came uh, to me and he said, all right, you know, I guess we're going to let this through and get a vote. And then he turned to me, and I had a group of co-authors, including some mm -hmm. Republicans, uh, but he was definitely not amongst them, and he'd been blocking us. And he said, before the bill passes, I want you to add me as a co-author. And so he went on as a co-author of the bill at the last minute. And if people look at the record, they'll see he added his name at the last moment. Wow. The bill passed almost unanimously with him voting for it. 
And then when he ran for governor, I later discovered in his literature, he put that he was a co-author of the bill to stop telemarketers. Yeah. So there's a good example of uh, a conversion that came a little, uh, yeah. a, a little late, but nevertheless, uh, our, our bill got through, and I'm very proud that we did a lot of things to go after telemarketers. Very nice. Um, and then in 2007, you left the legislature mm -hmm. and founded Minnesota 2020. And it's based on four pillars, is that correct? Yeah, it's, what, it's based on a belief that if we focus on what really matters, uh, if we focus on the issues that bring us together and that really matter for a state, we'll do well. And we believe that's education, health care, transportation, and economic development. And, and that it should be based not on, you know, I'm smarter than you are, or I'm taller than you are, or I'm going to yell louder than you are, which so often is the way things work nowadays but instead based on research and bringing people together and having real conversations and saying, how are we going to make sure we have the best public schools? Because when we have great public schools, and my kids, for example, all went to St. Paul Central, then people want to live in a community and people feel ownership in a community. When you've got good roads and good bridges, and of course as a state we know what happens when you don't have that, because we had the 35 bridge fall down just a few years ago, you build a great state. So Minnesota 2020 is based right here in St. Paul. Uh, a good chunk of the folks who work for it live right here in St. Paul as well. And uh, Governor Dayton just told me the other day, he reads it every single day. So it's mn2020.org, and I would encourage folks to look at it and to contribute because we have a lot of St. Paul writers and people who are, you don't have to be an academic, but people who are writing seriously about where we should go as a state, and our legislators and our governor are reading it, and they're taking direction from it. Now, transportation is one of the four main focus areas. Yeah. Roads have to be a subset of that. I would think potholes would have its own staff <laughs> member. <laughs> they are oh. awesome right now. Oh, I tell you, driving, uh, I know the uh, city uh, said that Hamlin was the worst, but I just about had my Ford fall completely into a pothole on Hamlin Avenue. Uh, it is just terrible. And what it is, it's you know partly a bad winter, but partly it's also the fact that we as a city have deferred maintenance for years on roads because of funding problems. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we really push at Minnesota 2020 is the obligation of the state and of us, of us all as a state to work together to make sure that we protect our infrastructure. And infrastructure is a boring word, but what it really means is you don't have to buy a new tire because you got a, an egg on the side of it from hitting a pothole so big that it wrecked the sidewall mm -hmm. of your tire. And a good friend of mine just had to put out a couple hundred bucks on a new tire because of a pothole. So when we say, oh, you know, we'll just defer street maintenance or we'll defer rebuilding roads, we're taxing ourselves in a different way. We're taxing ourselves in a way where we're making sure that we then pay money for realignment of our cars and having to rebalance our wheels and buy new wheels. Uh, or people, you know, literally can't drive on the streets, which some of our streets are like that right now. And it can be as simple as you know, having to replace the bridge rather than paint the bridge to prevent that kind of, <laughs> kind of fall down stuff. Although it was the gusset plates. It was originally a design flaw in the 2007 one. But, but just the road beds, if you don't maintain them properly, yeah. it's much more expensive to defer it than it is to maintain it properly. Yeah, what a road engineer will tell you, and when I say road engineer, I'm sure viewers are turning off their TV. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, we're going to talk about road engineers now. But look, we all drive on streets. I mean, if, or if you're not driving out, you're in a bus going down a street. Uh, and so hopefully soon light rail going down a street. But the reality is every few years that road has to be renewed and it has to be uh, you know, opened up and re-smoothed out and they have to make sure it's in good shape. And about every 40, 50 years, it's got to be taken down all the way to the dirt again and then rebuilt. And if you don't do that, it just collapses. You can only put those little asphalt patches in so many times. And that's the problem that we've had as a state is it's like the old ant and the grasshopper. People thought, oh, we can just keep saying that we'll do it a different day. Well, winter comes, and when winter comes, you get potholes, and you get schools uh, that aren't running well, and you have companies that say, why would I be in Minnesota? And you know, particularly when you're in a cold weather state, and I like cold weather, but if you're in a cold weather state, all your other things better work well if you want to keep people here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we're talking about roads, but politics is so much about a much shorter time frame. If you can make it vivid, you can win the next election. Mm -hmm. But just before we started this show, you were talking about policy and having been on a committee that was envisioning the rail line more than 20 years ago. Yeah. Well, it's an example of how you know some folks would say, oh, you know, we're finally getting light rail in St. Paul, and they don't realize the history of it. So I was on the Marion Park Community Council with little tiny kids uh, back in. <laughs> They're now all bigger than you. Yeah, that are, yes, <laughs> yes, that's for sure. And, uh, uh, and the reality is on the Marion Park Community Council, 
we were working with uh, the county and with the regional rail authority to say where should the stations be uh, because the central corridor, uh, the university corridor running from the University of Minnesota into St. Paul down University Avenue into the Capitol and downtown here was envisioned a long time ago. The, the opportunities we would have had to rejuvenate University Avenue, uh, to rejuvenate our downtown, to get economic development, because we're starting to see a lot of that, particularly on the west end of University Avenue, should have happened 20 years ago. And in the legislature, I was part of a group, we passed bills to do it, and then Governor Ernie Carlson uh, vetoed it and said, no, light rail won't work. And I tell you, uh, Jesse Ventura, I'll give him credit, he knew light rail would work, and unfortunately, uh, it was Hiawatha was the first line that went in. I it should have been the Central Corridor. But they've seen the development that's going on there, and you can see it today. Mm -hmm. uh, apartment buildings and other things that are flying up all over the places, and improvements in housing and jobs along that corridor. And the Central Corridor is going to be a huge success. And I'm really proud that when I was in the legislature, we got the key funding that began that process. And it takes many years to then pull it together, but now it's starting, and I'm going to be a very happy guy writing that line. Okay, great. Um, we got about seven minutes left, and I want to help you think about how we can parcel out and use the time wisely. We still have to cover uh, health, health policy um, and education and economic development, mm -hmm. and I want to end with uh, talking about Augsburg a little bit. Yeah. So, which of those first three? Well, you know, I think uh, healthcare is a good place. Uh, my family uh, was quite poor for a period of time. I lost my father when I was a teenager. And uh, we went through a period of time where we didn't have health care. And so I remember what that was like to be sick and to just kind of hope you'd get better because you couldn't really afford to go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm really proud of the fact that as a state, uh, we're, we're to the stage where everyone now can get access to health care. We don't have to uh, debate those things. But I think one of the things that we discovered uh, with uh, the new Mincher system there's a lot of complexity with it, and it can be very difficult for people to sort of figure it out. And I think one of the things that we need to do uh, is we need to try and find ways to make it easier for people to figure out what their health care options are. And I'm really strongly uh, in favor of what's called a single payer option. And what that would be is right now Medicaid, uh, which the state runs, has the lowest administrative cost of any system. And I think it's really exciting to imagine having health care where is people are saying, well, what options are they going to pick? That one of those be one that just picks up Medicaid and puts it in a state system. And I think that would be the most cost efficient. And Minnesota can be a leader. Uh, Vermont's looking at this now, too, to say that that kind of option that cuts out a lot of administrative costs and other things is one of the first places that we would go. And I hope, and it's one of the things I'm going to talk to Governor Dayton about, I think that we need to do in the next two years so that we have a single payer option out there. That sounds great. Yeah. Um, and that is a type of economic development. That's, that's exactly right. Because when health care is cheaper and affordable, it makes it a lot easier for people to start businesses. It makes it easier for businesses to want to stay here. Rising health care costs uh, you know, really hurt. And the middle class is going backwards. Uh, you're not, I mean, we have more poor people than we've had in the past, and the recession hasn't helped. But we've had a system where uh, the reality is the middle class has seen its wages stagnant or actually go backwards. It's only a few folks at the very top who've seen the amount of money go way up. And so if we can get a control of health care costs, that helps the economy all around, but it helps folks in the middle class who get squeezed because then employers, instead of having to take money away from wages and put into health care, can actually start paying people more again. And we need that. One of the reasons economics is so fascinating is because one person's cost is another person's price. and <laughs> You know, income from medicine, we have the Mayo Clinic in this state. It's one of yeah. the biggest engines in the world. So, you know, we, we don't want to squeeze everything, but we want them to be prosperous, but we also want people to get affordable health care. Yeah. But I think people generally think of health care as a cost, but let's switch to energy, because energy is, we are the Saudi Arabia of wind. And not only of wind, but we have a huge solar resource here. I mean, in the wintertime, it's cold, but we have lots and lots of sun. And the interesting thing uh, Pretend, John, for a moment that you were a solar you know, panel, you know, which you're a lot more handsome than a solar panel. But the reality is, as a solar panel, when it gets hot, you become less efficient. In Arizona, where people think, oh, this is a place that everyone should have solar, and they do have a lot, they literally have to bleed off some of that electricity and run air, air conditioning <laughs> over the top of those panels to keep them cooler. Well, in Minnesota, as we know, very rarely do we worry about things getting too hot, a couple weeks out of the summer. So we have a great solar resource, and I'm really proud to have worked with Governor Dayton so that we got a solar mandate this last year. And now in St. Paul and throughout the region, we're going to see solar gardens coming up where people are going to be able to buy in 
to a solar array that will be in their neighborhood, and Excel will pay you then for the electricity that's produced off of that. So we'll be able to become owners of solar. So even if you can't have it on your roof, you're going to be able to have it in your neighborhood. And we're going to see solar flying up all over the state, and wind is crucial too. Uh, the reality is we have to move away from coal. It's dumping mercury in our lakes so we can't eat the fish. It's polluting the atmosphere. Global warming is real, and it's caused by fossil fuels, and we can't afford that. And that means we need to move to renewables. And the great thing is we have no coal in Minnesota, and we have no oil in Minnesota. So when we buy solar and we buy wind and we buy biomass and other renewables, that keeps money here, and that's our best economic development. Um, what you're saying about the, the local solar is you can have an equity stake in creating it even if it's not physically on your land. That's exactly right. So legislation was passed this last year, uh, allows uh, companies to come in and uh, they will recruit it. It could be people through a church or it might be people within a given neighborhood, but they'll put a solar array together uh, and it might be on the roof of a, uh, of a uh, big building in your neighborhood. So in our area where we have a lot of commercial buildings on Grand, they might put the solar on top of a commercial building on Grand but then it will be owned partly by that building owner, but also by residents in that area. And Excel is required to buy that electricity. And then literally, you'll begin to get checks back from Excel. And that will then offset your utility bill. So what we're doing then is saying, let's not import coal from North Dakota, uh, which pollutes us. Let's buy our own power and create our own power right here. It's very exciting. We've got just a couple minutes left, but I want to quickly touch on, didn't Minnesota actually Default's not the right word, but fall down on the job in the development of wind power. The other states kind of leapt ahead of us right. in the early 2000s. And do we have private companies now making that up? And to what extent does the government play a part of it? Well, the reality is uh, both wind and solar are economically competitive now. Uh, but to get those industries started, uh, it was important that at the federal and at the state level that we have some incentives to get those things going because those are now in very important local industries. And so the state played a key role. Uh, in we have what's called a, uh, an RPS, a standard that says that 25% of our uh, energy should be produced by renewable sources, and Excel and other companies are moving towards that. But the reality uh, now is that they are cost competitive, and it's actually cheaper uh, to get solar. Uh, it was recently found than even natural gas, which is about the cheapest carbon fuel that's out there. So our state played a role in getting things going. The problem is under the Plenty Administration and others, they really poo-pooed that and uh, we didn't have things moving forward. And I give Dov Governor Dayton a lot of credit. We've really moved forward on some of those things now. So I think we're going to see a, a real resurgence of economic development and a better environment. And that's what we want. We've only got about 20 seconds left, but you are on the board of Augsburg College, which is the most diverse Lutheran college in America. Yeah, it's a, it's a great college. We just had two commencements. and. It's another example like McAllister and many of our other colleges training young people and some of us who aren't so young in doing great things uh, to make sure that Minnesota does better. And our colleges, and I'm, and I'm proud to be part of Augsburg, are doing uh, wonderful things to make sure that Minnesota stays very vibrant and on the cutting edge of things. Well, Matt, thank you very much. I've been speaking with Matt Entenza, Senior Fellow and Founder of the Minnesota 2020 Think Tank based in St. Paul. That's all we have time for. We hope to see you again next week on the St. Paul Forum.